I would like to introduce Ms. Uh, to Ms. Amita. To Amita Tambekar, ma'am. She has 20 years of experience working in various hospitals, clinics, and colleges in Mumbai, Vizak, and Surat. She has worked as consultant dietitian with Padma Shri, Dr. Shashank Joshi, and Dr. Durinder. She has also worked as a consultant dietitian for Medibias and Rinbaxi CV. She is a certified sports nutritionist and nutrigenetic counselor and involved in development of healthy snack bars for marathon runner, athletes and people with diabetes and pre-diabetes. She has worked as a consultant dietitian and program coordinator in Institute of Endocrinology, Hormone Hospital, Mumbai. She is the founder of NutriVenture, Speciality Nutrition Clinic, Surat. She is a club coordinator for IDA Gujarat chapter. She's the chief editor for IDAGC newsletter 2021, Treasurer IPIN Pseudo Chapter. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now I would like to introduce Ms. Uh, Tumobi Barman. She's a pediatric oncology nutritionist, placed at Dr. B. Vura Cancer Institute, Guwahati, under Cuddles Foundation, Mumbai. She has received Excellence Award for the year 2021 and 2022. She has also received appreciation for significant contribution to develop bone marrow program in 2022. She has past participated as faculty in revision of updates on hemato-oncology organized by Department of Medical Oncology on 27th and 28th August 2022, BBCI, on the topic Total Parenteral Nutrition. She has done poster presentation at 54th Annual Congress of International Society of Pediatric Oncology, Barcelona, Spain. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. I would like to welcome Ms. Rajshri Kajali, ma'am. She, uh, she has 20 years of experience working in various multi-speciality hospitals and clinics. She has worked as a senior dietitian at Nobisity Bariatric Department, KD Hospital, Ahmedabad. Worked as visiting faculty for Nutrition in Apollo Institute of Nursing. She has also worked as a visiting lecturer in VLCC Institute of Nutrition. She has experience in teaching nutrition for nursing students. She has experience in conducting corporate training programs regarding diet awareness and health, healthy lifestyle. She is an active member of Netrofen India. She is a lifetime member of Indian Dietetic Association Gujarat Chapter. Lifetime member of IPN, Indian Association for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. She is active member of Sri Chetna, which is Sri Shakti Gujarat chapter, associate member of Kidney Patient Welfare Society. We welcome you, ma'am. I would like to I would like to uh, ask all the panelists to please switch on their videos. Now, I would like to introduce to Ms. Simi Khanna, ma'am. She's award-winning dietitian, clinical nutritionist, and lifestyle coach and TEDx speaker. She has won many awards in the field of nutrition and fitness industry. She has written articles on nutrition and spread her thoughts for making life healthier and full of positivity in Namaste India e-magazine, Indian Menopause Society. She's a life member of Indian Dietetic Association, life member of ADE, which is Association of Diabetes Education. She designs nutrition uh, board games and fitness card games, and she has a lot of varieties of her own homemade health product, which is approved by food lab testing and FSSAI. She founded SK Lean in year 2016, a diet clinic situated in Jamnagar, serving personalized diet plans to clients worldwide to manage obesity, thyroid, PCOD, diabetes, hypertension, IBS, and all other lifestyle disorder. We welcome you, ma'am. Now, I would like to introduce to Ms. Swati Patel. She has 25 years of experience working as clinical dietitian. She has worked as a clinical dietitian with endocrinologist Dr. H.P. Chandalia, Mumbai. She is editorial assistant for Diabetes Today, an international journal of diabetes in developing country. She has been working at Alpha Healing Center, an alcohol and drug rehabilitation center. She's life member of Indian Dietetic Association and she has done many community health awareness program. We welcome you, Swati, ma'am. Now, I would like to introduce uh, to Ms. Vandana Hotwani, ma'am. She's working as a clinical dietitian in multi-speciality hospital. She has done training under Dr. Janak Nathan, pioneer of ketogenic diet. 
She has worked with more than 50 plus gastro doctors. She has received certificates for nutritional support in metabolic syndrome by European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism. She has received certificate for nutraceuticals for nutritionist and dietitian by Nutrify Today Academy. She's life member of Indian Dietetic Association. We welcome you, Vandana, ma'am. Hello, everybody. Yeah, it's audible. I would like to introduce uh, Nilanjana ma'am again. I would also ask Nilanjana ma'am and request her to please join the panel uh, panel discussion. Yeah, I'm here. Ashika, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to our panel discussion. Uh, our topic for today is the triad of wellness microbiome, micronutrients, and disease prevention. Uh, may I request all the panel members to uh, switch on their videos? Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, let's, uh, let's begin with Nilanjana, ma'am. I'm sure there are a lot of questions that other panel members also may have. Uh, I'd like to begin with one que uh, two questions, ma'am. Mm -hmm. well, the first being, uh, like you said, that you know, having deficiencies during the first thousand days impacts a child's life uh, throughout their adulthood as well. So what can we be uh, doing during pregnancy to prevent uh, the micronutrient deficiencies amongst children, especially amongst the urban population? Um, the life cycle approach like you talked about in your presentation. So... Even if we talk about children, we need to talk about the pregnant mother. And the diet, of course, they enhance nutrients that are required during pregnancy. We should try and meet that. And there are certain nutrients which require supplementation in pregnancy. So uh, very often there could be women who feel that it's okay, I will perhaps just increase my diet and I don't need to take a supplement. So uh, the bioavailability of these, um, these minerals and these vitamins can be improved through some of these supplements like we talked about probiotic, prebiotic supplementation. So although we can't overhaul the diet, it's very difficult to do that for anybody. But once you counsel them, you tell them what are the increased needs. So we can think about those supplements which increase the bioavailability. And even in the diet, like supposing you're having something that's iron rich, maybe you're having uh, some, some green leafy vegetable. So to add to that, you can sprinkle some lemon on it to increase the bioavailability of it. So those strategies, even with food and with supplement, should be the focus of our attention. Thank you, ma'am. And ma'am, uh, what are the changes? Sorry, Sheetal, I'll just add one more thing. Like uh, ma'am said that we can, uh, uh, the bioavailability to add vitamin C whenever we are taking an iron. So a good combination is always there is halim seeds is excellent in iron and it can be taken in lime juice. So this is some easy combination which can be suggested to people and they can include it in their uh, daily routine. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, begin with the next question, does any other panel member have a question for Nilanjana, ma'am? Questions? Oh, Maybe they'll come up later. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Ma'am, you have beautifully covered uh, all the yeah. topics. Oh, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> and it was self-elaborating uh, things. So, again, like... Uh, it was so nicely elaborated and so nicely presented, ma'am. It was really wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ma'am, what is the difference? Uh, there is enough research to show that there is difference in uh, the gut microbiome of a child who is delivered naturally versus a child delivered by the C-section. Mm -hmm. What are the changes uh, that must be incorporated uh, in both cases? Or what must we be mindful of? 
to ensure that we help the child have a better gut health within the first thousand days. So, uh, as much as possible, one should try for a vaginal delivery. And you know that there is a tendency. There are many reports of how how there is now a tendency to go in for a C-section. And then once you go in for a C-section, the child does not get the vaginal microbes uh, into the system. And interestingly, this was done uh, in the olden days where there was a swab with the vaginal contents, which the child was made to sort of cover his mouth or his or her mouth so that they imbibe those microbiota. So put it towards, towards the nose and the mouth. So this was done in the olden days. What we do now is, of course, the importance of breastfeeding. I think once the child, you cannot help certain deliveries being uh, by C-section. If you can't help it, then the focus should be on breastfeeding and then uh, weaning, weaning with homemade foods and not getting into processed foods right from the beginning. So these are two things and as much as possible going for a vaginal delivery. So that those are things which can be done. Thank you so much, ma'am. My next question is for uh, Amita. Uh, what is the impact of gut dysbiosis and absorption of nutrients on a leaky gut? And does it okay. lead to a leaky gut? Yeah. So thank you, Sheetal. Uh, see, the Nilanjana ma'am also have uh, mentioned in her uh, slides that human gut is, you know, a dynamic ecosystem consisting of trillions of microorganisms, which includes your symbiotics, common cells and pathogenic organisms. So we are not uh, uh, left alone, you know, if anyone is feeling little lonely. You know, there are, uh, we can say that you're never left alone. We have so many uh, tiny creatures with us that, uh, you know, help us or support us in maintaining our health. Now, uh, usually in a healthy individual, there is a balance or there's a harmony between these microbes in terms of the diversity, composition and the distribution. Uh, now, when this uh, microbial balance gets disturbed or changed due to some triggers like, you know, a change of a diet or a stress or excessive use of antibiotics, it could lead to several unhealthy changes or it could lead to gut dysbiosis. Now, uh, there could be less diversity of the beneficial uh, microorganisms or the pathogenic one might get uh, increased. And uh, this uh, imbalance can lead to, you know, many um, unhealthy changes. We have seen in our slide that, you know, uh, this uh, microorganisms uh, have or they play a specific functions. They have, they carry out different physiological functions like digestion, utilization, absorption of different nutrients. It also helps in harvesting energy to us, you know, via the fermentation of the non-digestible dietary components that is the fiber. Therefore, there, if there is any imbalance or dysbiosis, gut dysbiosis, it affects the entire process of the nutrient utilization, absorption, metabolism of different metabolism. And of course, the various functions that the each, uh, you know, uh, this microbes is uh, supposed to do, they all get compensated. Now, this gut bacteria have the ability to synthesize and produce different vitamins like the vitamin K. You know, half of our vitamin K uh, uh, requirement is fulfilled with this microbes. So if they are compromised, this vitamin K uh, synthesis is also hampered. They are also involved in biotin, folate, vitamin B12 uh, synthesis. And these vitamins produced by this microbe significantly fulfill the uh, nutrient requirements of our body. So if this if there is a gut dysbiosis, then definitely this is going to be get compromised. Uh, we are not going to get the uh, required um, quantities of the vitamin B12 or the uh, other uh, vitamins. Now, the gut microbiome also influences the metabolism of different minerals like, you know, iron, calcium, magnesium, zinc. They also enhance the solubility and the absorption of these minerals. 
which increases the bioavailability to the host as we just talked about the bioavailability of iron. Uh, so the gut microbiome helps in the metabolism of this micronutrients like the carbohydrates, proteins, fats. It is also involved in the bile acid metabolism. So if it is uh, gut if there is a gut dysbiosis, then uh, definitely bile acid uh, uh, metabolism is also going to get affected. And then, you know, we require this for the absorption of the fat soluble vitamins. That is the vitamin A, D, E, K. So it is not only the vitamins that uh, that are synthesized by this microbes is going to get compromised, but it is also helping the other fat soluble vitamins for in absorption of this nutrient. So all of this is going to get, you know, affected when there is a uh, gut uh, dysbiosis. Now coming back to, you know, the leaky gut uh, hypothesis. So, uh, you know, this, um, the gut microbiome also plays an important role in maintaining the integrity of the gut barrier. They produce different metabolic products like, you know, uh, we just talked about the short chain fatty acid, also the indols or the hydroxy uh, fatty acids. And these substances maintain the integrity of the tight junction barrier. And uh, thus it prevents, you know, the translocation of pathogenic um, uh, organisms and the toxins produced by these pathogenic organisms across the membrane. Now, if this integrity is getting affected, now the, uh, naturally there is a translocation of this uh, pathogenic ones into the uh, bloodstream from the gut. And, you know, this leakage can ca cause different pro-inflammatory uh, reactions, you know, uh, and um, uh, they can trigger uh, the immune response. Uh, which can lead to inflammation and infections or any disease conditions. So yes, the gut dysbiosis um, affects the absorption of uh, the nutrients, the micronutrients, as well as the macronutrients metabolism. And uh, it can also lead to leaky gut because it is affecting the, um, uh, the gut integrity uh, by this um, organisms. Thanks. Thank you, Amita. I think that was a wonderful explanation and a very detailed one. I'm sure it will be very helpful to all our delegates. Uh, may I now request uh, Rajeshi, ma'am, what would be the MNT for gut dysbiosis? As Amita has shared that, you know, it's going to impact not only vitamins, minerals, but even our macronutrients. Yeah. So what would be the MNT for gut dysbiosis? And uh, MNT, if we discuss, it will be based on providing micronutrients first. Basic thing will be micronutrients and again, keeping an eye to my macronutrients as well. But micronutrients along with pre and probiotics will be the basic uh, guideline for MNT. And uh, again, the choice of pre and probiotics will be uh, will depend on how that gut biosis is manifestation manifested if it is manifesting like your uh, digestive diseases like ibs and ibd sort of thing or maybe digestive problems and all and that time we have to go for low fodmap diet uh, but if that is not the case then we can there is a variety and privilege to use all you know, those pre uh, pre and probiotic uh, things uh, like maybe it those are all fresh all fruits fresh and vegetables products. and maybe all the dairy products and even soya products and also many things are there which can be used at pre and probiotics our of course it will be providing micronutrients flora as well so this way that can be the um, uh, gut uh, dysbiosis mnt and definitely uh, these all these uh, basic guideline will be providing micro and macronutrients along with pre and probiotics because the reason and the result will be micronutrient deficiency for all these gut dysbiosis. Yeah. Thank you. Can actually, you know, test the microflora and you know we can actually see the uh, which microflora you are lacking and you know you can accordingly plan a more uh, personalized or individualized yeah. uh, medical nutrition yeah program. and that can be useful while choosing the probiotic flora as well yes nilanjana you also spoke about smt mm -hmm. yes and could you please uh, share a little more and elaborate on that so, uh, FMT is being tried out for uh, many conditions, many of these NCDs. And I think the good results, like I said, is happening not, not with the NCD so much as the Clostridium difficile diarrhea and the, uh, 
antibiotic associated diarrhea those are two condition but the clostridium difficile is actually a life threatening condition and the kind of results that that they have got with it has also made it somewhat like mainstream of course you need a whole setup for that and there are certain big hospitals which are having that setup but i think for it to sort of percolate and go everywhere it's still some time but in the meantime what one can do is those tools the other tools that we talked about probiotic symbiotics and also fermented foods i think those are also uh, a source of good micronutrients as well as these uh, gut flora which can sort of help in the absorption of nutrients bioavailability becomes important and that's how we talk so fmt is also being looked at for nafld like i said that is my area of interest so that certain uh, centers are doing that so i think in the future we'll see more and more conditions where uh, fmt may benefit thank you thank you ma'am ma'am along with fmt uh, what are the supplements that you would recommend or is it that only fmt is recommended and no other supplements at that time no i don't think the supplements are requ uh, required at that time because fmt is is something that needs to be done and you need to see how how the person the individual reacts to it. so it's not like you have a multimodal kind of therapy where you do so many things together so in order to see the effect of one thing you do fmt and uh, if you are in a research setup of course then you have to be more careful about what you add on and you concentrate on fmt itself ma'am i am have a question for you ma'am uh, how long does it take for the gut to recover after taking the antibiotics you said the butyric acid the juice of four fold so how long does it so, take to recover so uh, depending on the so a lot of uh, supplementation is also recommended with probiotics when you're taking antibiotics so um the only thing is you don't have to take it along with the antibiotic many people have the antibiotic and maybe if they are having a supplement of the probiotic have it together the idea is to give a gap and usually it's recommended that you give a gap of 2 hours and then if you supplement with the probiotic very good results have been seen and the the uh, defect of the antibiotic is mitigated so the dysbiosis is mitigated and i think within a week of course there are many different studies i won't be able to give you a generalized view but uh, with antibiotic associated diarrhea supplementing with the probiotic has shown very good results thank you ma'am thank you swati for the question my next question is to uh, vandana ma'am what are the most common types of ibs uh, that you have seen and uh, amongst them which are the key micronutrient deficiencies most commonly observed in ibd ibs if we talk about that is constipated or diarrhea or maybe some mixed so some of the people they have constipated some of them have the recurrent diarrhea episodes of diarrhea or maybe some mixed of the constipation and diarrhea so uh, micronutrient deficiency can be ruled out like they are deficient in um, b vitamin b and they may be deficient in iron deficiency is called uh, found and maybe some folate so in that case we try to work it out with the to justify them we try to work it out with the fibers and good amount of hydration that is all from the food sources and that is lifestyle modification because that is where we are trying to build up the good microbiome the colonies that have been affected the bad bacteria that has been uh, that has been overcome that has to be justified with the giving of the good building up of the colonies of the good bacteria that we say that is common common cells what we uh, call about so what we do is we put them into the fibers and uh, like uh, fibers that is soluble fibers to justify the mucosa membrane because the mucosa needs a remission first it goes into the remission and then there is a recovery is seen and lifestyle modification and hydration part so this is where we try to justify since they are chronic in that case okay. thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, ma'am also could you elaborate uh, more on uh, the micronutrients that uh, could be a could play a key role in reviving the gut microbiome for ibd patients 
IBD. IBD that is inflammatory bowel disease, right? So in that case, we need a micronutrient. So we work it out with the vitamins and minerals, both of them. Like vitamins, we deal with A, D, uh, B, and K. So this vitamin K, as talked about, that is generated itself when we uh, uh, work, you work it out with a good bacteria in that case. And the supplementation is from that. So that is what has to be worked out with the orally. And minerals, we try to work it out with the calcium, like hung curd we give itself in the morning. So that like uh, breakfast is done with the paratha, what they, if they have been consuming. So in that case, we work it out with the fibers and the curd in that. So it goes with the good bacteria that is probiotic can be worked out. And the calcium, it has, has a tendency of building up of the quantity of the good bacteria as such. The minerals, they have the role to be played. And the same way phosphorus, it also it adds on to the number of the colonization of the good bacteria. So we try to justify them with the minerals and the vitamins with the dietary supplementation that is dietary sources itself from itself from the detox to the dinner, the whole thing. Detox is there, then morning, breakfast, lunch. So this is where we work it out with the vitamins and minerals. Thank you. Thank you, Anandha, ma'am, for sharing your experience. Uh, I'd like to now ask Amita again, what is the impact of uh, different Indian diets on a healthy gut microbiome? For example, could you help us compare between vegetarian, vegan, non-vegetarian, pescetarian diet? Yes, yes. So our diet is the main contributing factor which affects the gut microbiome because uh, as we eat, we are not provide we are not only providing the nourishment to our body, but we are also providing the food for our microorganisms because they feed on this uh, the food we eat, and then the gut microflora gets uh, developed. So the, your diet definitely affects the um, gut microbiome. It, it influences the pH of the colon. It also, um, uh, you know, it also, you know, it also favors the cross feeding of different microorganisms. Like the more beneficial uh, products are formed, and then these products are uh, taken by the other organisms, which again forms the uh, more beneficial products, which are beneficial to our body. So uh, a diverse uh, microbiome or a resilient microbiome has a wide variety of organisms and each performs its own function. So we should have a diet which, which is more diverse, as we just talked about, which gives more diversity in, on your plate than it gives more diverse microflora. So the diet should uh, increase the richness and the diversity of the microflora. Now, uh, there are certain uh, dietary substances like the resi resistant starch or the fibers like inulin that stimulate the growth of the polysaccharide utilizing uh, or the, you know, butyric producing uh, bacteria so that the more butyrate is formed. And we just talk about how butyrate is important in, uh, you know, health promotion, like it is the anti-inflammatory uh, or it, it maintains the gut uh, integrity. So the more butyrate forming organisms are formed, it is more beneficial. So uh, when the diet is, you know, uh, very low in carbohydrates, like a, a low uh, low carbohydrate diet or uh, the uh, ketogenic diet which are low in fiber then definitely such diets is not supporting the uh, butyrate forming uh, organisms and we are missing out on the roles that this bacteria uh, is forming so uh, the low carbohydrate it also you know um, uh, increases the clostridium species as we just talked about how clostridium species is uh, not beneficial or harmful to our body so we definitely don't want this uh, clostridium species to get flourished so uh, definitely a very low carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet is not very helpful in terms of our gut microflora. Now, also there are many studies which supports that protein consumption positively affects the gut microflora. But also uh, the source of protein is also very important. The uh, animal protein or the plant-based proteins are more beneficial than the uh, animal-based proteins. Now, the consumption of the whey or the pea protein extract has been supported, uh, has been reported to increase the gut uh, common cells like the bifidobacterium and the lactobacillus, which is which we want to in, uh, increase. And uh, uh, they additionally decrease this pathogenic uh, bacteria. 
uh the animal protein um, uh, diets you know and ma'am just talked about you know it increases the levels of trimethylene and oxide and uh, that causes you know very uh, pro atherogenic um, uh, compounds and so that can lead to uh, athero uh, atherosclerotic changes so uh, proteins are important but not uh, the source of protein is important the plant based proteins are found to be more beneficial than the animal proteins but also it has been uh, seen that if we uh, add lactose then the uh, beneficial uh, bacteria or the healthy bacteria is increased as compared to the vegan or the uh, uh, you know uh, vegetarian diets so um so you know the uh, th these things we should uh, uh, you know see while selecting the diet so the most um, uh, the diet even there are some studies of course that is a very small study which says that the gluten uh, gluten free diets also decreases the beneficial bifidobacterium counts and increases the uh, pathogenic count so uh, it's a small study but definitely you know we need to study this more you know rather than uh, you know uh, opting for the trending diets gluten free and you know getting uh, more into the popular diets we should see uh, which diet is more uh, beneficial or uh, good for our health uh, and we should select such kind of diet and uh, of course as um, uh, everyone has said you know uh, rajashree ma'am and even nilanjana ma'am the planning of the diets the different things also we should cater so we should combine all this gut microflora knowledge with our uh, dietetics and uh, plan the more uh, suitable diets or helpful diets to our clients this one i have yeah, yeah. Very, very important point that amita has highlighted unnecessary restriction in the diet i mean unless it's therapeutically required people tend to go off many things whether yes. it is carbohydrates or whether it is many things that they sort of when become whimsical and so a diverse diet is very important so i just wanted to say that it's a very important point that you mentioned yes uh, ma'am i have a question how about lean meats see this formation of trimethylene amine and oxide and all would be with uh, a high fat uh, source mm -hmm. of uh, protein non vegetarian foods right mm -hmm. but if we are using lean meats or if we are using egg whites what is that's, the that's, answer to that that's fine yeah. oh sorry amita you go yeah actually there are um, uh, certain studies you know which uh, says that yes lean meats like your, your fish and whatever you have mentioned is uh, egg is uh, good but you know when we compared with the other plant based diets there in terms of gut microflora not the other things you know uh, i'm highlighting it's just in terms of gut microflora but it doesn't have a very um, you know, what do you say a very favorable effect on our gut microflora so the more plant based diets uh, and then i just add something that it should be predominantly a plant based diet so it's if you take huge amounts of processed meats definitely it's going to affect your gut so if it's a predominantly plant based with uh, lean meat that's fine provided it's not processed when it's processed then we have a yeah and you know uh, another Man, but fish thing, and egg whites i think should be good enough yeah yes for the dietetic need, point of view that's protein. okay uh, we can have that and even in gut microbiome you know if we uh, follow our diet for a longer period of times then this gut microflora gets changed so uh, occasionally yes you can have you can um, if you like then you can have it but uh, it's the it's the more you know the restrictive diets like you know week, completely yeah. eating a certain group of uh, uh, food groups is not food advisable because, because you know for long term it the gut microflora gets changed and uh, 
sometimes you know the uh, uh, some species we uh, literally get lost during this uh, period you know if we are continuously having a very restrictive diet the healthy the most uh, important uh, health gut flora is getting lost and that is a permanent loss then only that uh, just man mentioned that the trans uh, fecal or the stool trans uh, transplantation is the only option so why to go to that level moderation is the key which we always yeah. say thank you amita thank i got the answer you. thank you neelan chinna ma'am uh hi sachin definitely every hi i thought you did the side the listen very very much i can't sheetal i am you are not audible sheetal now is it better uh, is it better I think Sheetal will only yeah, but there is a lot of buzzing. The speaker be on and the other speaker should be off, otherwise the disturbance will be prolonged. Only the one who is staying should on the speaker. Then this background music yeah, will be there. She's right. Yes, Sheetal. There is some echo actually. Yes. mute your sir sathi ke mute your sir ha ah, okay that that was good okay great thanks sathi uh, so my next question is to simi and uh, how does the gut microbiome impact the circadian rhythm and therefore the sleep cycle digital detox is the now in thing so how how can we help okay now i'll try to keep i'll just share a story before i uh, start this we all know that uh, diseases starts from our gut okay gut health and uh, there was a there was a discussion going on among the body parts you know so the brain said i am the most important uh because i help you change everything in your body uh the heart says no no i am more important because i help you uh the help beating the heart and you know that's how your body keeps going then the liver says no no i am more important because i um, absorb i uh, you know i do the metabolization and everything so i am important so the last came the gut so the gut said i am the most important you know why because i absorb i secrete i reabsorb i do all the functions in the body and then everybody started laughing oh it's not possible so it got angry and it got shut down so once it, the gut was shut everybody realized okay now i we realize that the gut is the most important thing so whatever we do whether it is whatever we put in our body or uh, the changes that we make in our lifestyle everything contributes to the cardiac rhythm in our body that's what i have that personal experience with me so when it comes to sleep a lot of factors in today's world has come up maybe it's a social media maybe it's the white light or maybe it's the dopamine effect where people are just surfing on to the reels uh, you know so these are all the things which is affecting our uh, microbes and the more the white light the gut bacteria i feel the good bacteria reduces and the bad bacteria uh, increases and uh, sleep after covid has become a very very common factor among all the age group whether it is a teenager or whether it's a, a, a old person uh, everybody suffers to the sleep uh, quality or the sleep issues so i feel uh, a change in the diet and uh, inclusion of certain uh, breathings and a certain uh, exercise helps to sleep better uh, say for example it is seen that a chamomile tea uh, helps to sleep better why because it has got a thing called as epigenin in it which helps the gut microbe to change and then it will induce sleep so if you take the chamomile tea somewhere around 6:37 then by around 10 you tend to feel a little drowsy and i don't say that you have to make it like a lifestyle habit of having the chamomile tea but just to regularize the system and the mind to understand that something is inducing it uh, i've seen a lot of left nostril breathing 
uh, which I have been teaching it to my clients, really work well because the left side of our brain is the cooler uh, side of our body. So they say that when you are calmer, uh, the gut microbe changes and it gives you a better uh, microbe in your body. So I feel when you uh, make a combination of all these things, when you take a daily dose, now when I say a daily dose, it has to be a uh, dopamine, it has to be oxytocin, it has to be serenitin, it has to be endorphin. Now, how do you get this? So by you get a combination of diet, the combination of exercise and a combination of a little bit of breathing technique, and most important, stress. So these will help you to improve the stress. In turns, improve the quality of sleep. So it's like a mixture of all. That's what I would I would say that this will improve the cardiac rhythm of the sleep, and in turn, our gut bacteria improves. Thanks, Mimi. I think we'll all appreciate and remember the story for sure. I think that was very interesting and a very holistic perspective to uh, improving the gut microbiome. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks. My next question is to Rajshree, ma'am. Ma'am, what diet and lifestyle factors lead to a vicious cycle of the poor gut microbiome, hormonal balance, and therefore also leading to PCOS? Ma'am, you need to unmute. Yeah, uh, when we say about uh, lifestyle, it comes to unhealthy lifestyle, unhealthy eating habits, unhealthy working hours, unhealthy food choices. So many things, they are collectively working on the body. And again, it is uh, impacting the stress, sort of a stress on the body. That stress will be actually uh, on the body itself and on your immune system as well. When the stress is there, there is micronutrient deficiency, micronutrient deficiency. They are combating to the, uh, actually adding on to the biological stress. And this is emotional stress, maybe psychological stress and maybe physical stress and all those things because there are no exercise schedules, there, there are no good foods and all. If at all we try for a good food, again, we are deteriorating quality of uh, food, whatever we are getting as a natural and fresh fruits and all. So all these things are adding to your stress levels. And once the stress levels are increased, there is more secretion of uh, like uh, catecholamines and maybe some uh, what to say that uh, bad hormones then these hormones will be decreasing the immunity levels colamines these hormones will be decreasing the immunity levels and these disease conditions they are leading to disease condition and disease condition itself putting a stress now these stress levels always combated like maybe some obesity hoga, maybe some uh, constipation, maybe some sleepless nights, okay? all these things, again, in the stressed conditions, what we are going to go is wrong food choices. In the stressed condition, no one will go for green tea and no one will go for a plate of salad and all of this, definitely. And stressed itself will be, if we backward, uh, like uh, spell the backward, it is coming as deserts, right? So all these food choices will be putting again a stress and these stress are definitely working on our hormonal levels and hormonal levels are Again, defeating to all our whole gut microbiota, our dysbiosis and whole our body things. And again, once we are coming into gut biases, gut dysbiosis, again, there is a micronutrient deficiency. There is a vicious cycle and somewhere we have to break that vicious cycle. So that is what I believe in. Very well said, ma'am. Somewhere we definitely have to break it. And yeah. oil has definitely played a key role in us not getting the micronutrients. Despite yes. The Yes. So if at all we are trying for natural and fresh fruit foods and all, if at all uh, so many dietitians are telling to go for fresh fruits and all, some person also goes. But if at all he is going for that natural food, where he is getting that pure quality of food into that? Like whatever uh, expected micronutrients are there. Suppose if we are talking about a single tomato, where that lycopene levels are there. So all these things are really adding a burden on micronutrient deficiency. Yes, so very true, ma'am. Therefore, our government is also pushing for fortification of yes, yeah. and all these uh, like deficiencies and all these uh, hormonal imbalances they are leading to early puberty, early menopause, and maybe some infertility, maybe that PCOS like PCOD diseases, so many other things according to the hormonal disturb uh, disturbances. So there are these are the facts we are living with, and somewhere you have to break those facts. 
Yes, thank you so much, ma'am. May I now invite Simi to please share a holistic perspective on how to break this vicious cycle of stress and desert. Uh, to be very honest, uh, you know, as everybody knows that uh, you come up with a solution, come up with a problem, and I come up with a solution, and uh, that's why uh, people call me like a food innovator. Uh, if somebody says I like this, okay, I turn the recipe onto it and I give it to them. So the best part when I when I talk about desserts, I say people uh, people ask me a lot of questions: Is sugar good? Is bishri good? Or is jaggery good? So I said nothing is good. So then they say, if this is not good, then how do we make it sweet? So I said, okay, you can use dates. But so say, for example, if some diabetes have come to me and they say, oh, we can't use dates. So I'll say use cinnamon. So I think uh, understanding the uh, person's uh, condition who has approached you for the particular way, how we can not devoid him by telling that, okay, don't have this. But by giving him a solution of saying, okay, you can have this. And I feel uh, the more we study the food, uh, the more we can come up with innovative uh, ideas. Uh, I will just give one small example. We all know curry leaves are very good when it comes to a hormonal imbalance or something like that. Now, curry leaves, if you say someone to have it, they are not going to have it. But then I turned the curry leaves into a podi. So, which they can mix it up with the rice and have it. The taste was awesome. Uh, nutritive value matched everything. Uh, people loved it. It goes. You can go for moringa podi. So, I think when you educate the uh, people, which is not time consuming, which can be stored for fifteen days at the room temperature, I think uh, we can still guide them or we can push them to eat a little healthy food rather by you know giving them a big list and if they are working which is not going to be uh, possible uh, secondly staying in acs has led to a uh, water consumption too low or people have become very conscious in just over drinking the water so i think that balance of hydration is very important when it comes to gut microbe because i feel it's important um, in terms of giving a healthy gut, we need to maintain the hydration factor too. So this is how I would say that uh, you tell me your issue and I would come up with a, uh, with a nice solution, with a package and give it to you uh, regarding that. So I feel uh, once you start making these uh, minor changes, when the people start making these small, small changes, like uh, just deep breathe. You know? When you're sitting on a computer, just breathe deep and then just be yourself calm uh, when you give them small small doable things they get the confidence of doing it and then that's the time when they are ready to make more changes in their uh, uh, life that is my approach towards uh, dealing with a good good my um, gut microbe i always focus more on the fermented foods so the traditional old uh, fermented rice uh, I have a technique wherein I ask them to add the flax seeds in the end for omega-3 uh, so that the cravings for the sweet uh, doesn't uh, come. So when you mix it with a prebiotic, it's already po post probiotics is already there. So when you mix the onion and a carrot for a prebiotic in the fermented rice with an omega-3, it, it like makes a complete bowl. Uh, if so, if somebody doesn't have time in the morning to make a breakfast, they can do this in the night before going to sleep so that they can have a bowl of probiotics and prebiotics to improve the gut microbe right from the morning breakfast. Great. I think very that's true. a wonderful suggestion to begin yeah, the day. Very true. Very true, Sinmi. Uh, and actually, uh, that is the Thank way you. a dietitian has to work with the clients. It should be more feasible to them. It should be attractive. It should be very much uh, nutrient intense also. And at the same time, it should be again uh, pocket friendly as well. So yeah, all these things has, have to be considered while consulting the diet. That's thank you, Th thank you, Simi. Thank you, Rajshri, ma'am. Really appreciate it. I think my next question is for uh, Swati Patel, and that is: uh, Does a poor gut microbiome uh, lead to type 2 diabetes and what is the mechanism for that? My only request to all the other panelists in the interest of time that we've already reached 454. So if we could keep the answers brief uh, for our delegates, that would be really helpful. Swati, uh, could you please unmute yourself? Yeah, I could not hear your question. Can you repeat the question? Please? 
Aswati, there is so an echo coming from your side. Are there two devices on? Uh, no, I don't think so. You may just mute one device. Okay, I'll try. Okay, now? Yes. Are you better. able to hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So, my okay. question to you is, yeah. what are the mechanisms by which a poor gut microbiome uh, will lead to type 2 diabetes? Okay. So, I think uh, this part is beautifully been covered by Nilanjana, ma'am. But still, I'll attempt this question. So, research suggests that an imbalance in the gut microbiome, which we all call it as dysbiosis, may have a role in the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus. And this could be either due to inflammation, because dysbiosis can lead to low-grade inflammation, and this inflammation can impair insulin signaling, or it could disrupt uh, glucose metabolism. And Either of this can lead to insulin resistance, which we know is a characteristic of type 2 diabetes mellitus. It could also be due to increased energy extraction. Now, when we talk about gut microbiome, we know that species. So, there are a, a kind of bacterial species which are able to extract more energy from the food that we eat. Now, say if a person has uh, this particular bacterial species in a higher population, then probably the energy excreted from his or her diet is going to be more leading to weight gain or obesity, which again is a risk factor for diabetes mellitus. And it could also be because short-chain fatty acids, we discussed a lot about it. So the gut microbiome produces uh, short-chain fatty acids as a byproduct of fermenting uh, uh, the dietary fiber. And butyrate is a beautiful example of this, which has a role in regulating glucose metabolism and the insulin sensitivity. So when there is a decreased amount of these kind of bacteria, which uh, produces uh, butyrate, again, there are chances of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes mellitus. And it could also be gut permeability. So we know dysbiosis can lead to uh, leaky gut where harmful substances like polysaccharides may enter the bloodstream. And when this levels are elevated in the bloodstream, it could again lead to low grade of inflammation, which we already discussed that inflammation could be a reason for insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, well, certain metabolites also like the trimethylene and oxide, which can influence metabolic processes and high levels of this can also increase the risk of CVD and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Also, it uh, modulates the lipid metabolism. It uh, metabolizes the bile acids, which can also interfere with the lipid metabolism and glucose metabolism, leading to type 2 diabetes mellitus and uh, CVD. I think I was too fast because we have less time. <laughs> I hope everybody's understood what I'm trying to say. Uh, but yeah, all... <laughs> All said and done, more researches are in line and we need more researchers to prove this. Thank, Thank you, so Swati. Much. I have one more question for you, Swati. What is the one key nutrient yes. that you like to focus on in your practice to revive a gut microbiome, to, remove, to improve the energy levels for patients with thyroid, PCOS or metabolic syndrome? Is there one key nutrient that you would definitely focus on? So, Sheetal, if you ask for one key nutrient, it's going to be very unfair. It's like asking the mother, whom do you like more, the daughter or the son? Okay. So, it's very unfair. So, I think we need a, uh, we need a whole lot of nutrients. We need our micronutrients. We need our macronutrients in the form of dietary fibers. We, need, we know, know that magnesium, selenium, zinc, all of them are so important with regulation of so many metabolic processes like magnesium for insulin secretion, insulin sensitivity, selenium is an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, zinc is needed for hormone production like insulin and other hormones and it also helps to uh, regulate the irregular menstrual cycles. So we need all of this plus our probiotic. The prebiotic is the dietary uh, that we need. So it's a mixture of all that we have to eat. So somebody in the group, I think Amita said that we cannot afford to leave a single food group. So I think we need all of this. Very yeah, that's a very nice answer, Swati, that you don't don't want to single out one. And they are all <laughs> interconnected. So beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swati. I, I totally agree with your answer. I wouldn't leave out a single nutrient too. So yeah, uh, thank you. over to you again. Uh, what are the important, uh, like constipation seems to be something that our elders were always concerned about. But somewhere along the line, uh, 
it's been forgotten that constipation is actually a concern and uh, being constipated could lead to a lot of chronic inflammation and therefore a poor gut so what is imperative to have a healthy gut microbiome and healing from the root cause to me the question is for you uh i i thought it was for swati <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so when uh, see in today's uh, as I said in today's world, our habits have changed, and uh, constipation actually in India is not considered as a disease. Uh, people don't even know that it is a disease. Actually, uh, for them, it is like okay, chalta hai. Two days baad aayega, so it's okay. It's that kind of an attitude. But it's like creating an awareness that this is the root cause. uh for all the diseases that is there uh, because we all know that all diseases starts from the gut so once it's the constipation when we are sitting for a very long period of time uh, or where there is no uh, movement uh, of course uh, you know it's a, it's a repetitive of all the uh, panelist and or nilanjana ma'am's uh, slides uh, put together that when there is a gut uh, 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 imbalance in our body uh, that's the time when uh, the constipation uh, takes place so i think when we improve uh, the each and every aspect by having a when we have a plant based diet definitely we are taking in a lot of fibers inside our uh, uh, in our plate and then when we hydrate ourselves Uh, it swells and that's how the mechanism uh, starts so i feel it's a combination of everything that we put together can cure this particular uh, constipation uh, problem of course we have to check whether the uh, person is either not deficient in vitamin b uh, the vitamin levels of the person is proper or not is the person stressed or not because again in all these conditions again the gut microbe uh, keep changing uh, so I, I, a small solution what i tell people uh, to give uh, during the constipation is uh, whenever you are having a salad uh, just sprinkle a little ajma on top of it uh, and i want you to chew the food till it turns into water inside your mouth and i think once you do that uh, trust me uh, your gut bacteria is going to be good uh, because we have microbes in our mouth so the digestion actually starts inside our mouth with the saliva so once when we have forgotten to chew our food so when you when you chew the food properly try it it's not easy uh, to just you know sit and count the number of times you can chew that particular food and the more the plant based diet you have the more the chewing uh, time it takes so that really helps in the digestion that really helps in increasing the gut microbes the good my gut microbes and that if you do this it don't land up in any of the uh, gut issues it tends to become uh, lesser day by day so i would say that thank you thank you so much simi i'm sure we all tell our patients to every morsel of food 32 oh. times as many teeth as you have So yes, I'm sure all of us on the panel agree with you. Uh, Sheetal, I would just tell you through my practical experiences, 32 times we say it, but it's not possible. Uh, each food, uh, if you're eating rice, it is absolutely not possible to uh, chew it for 30, uh, 32 times, and you will not believe it. I started this ritual by counting the number of chews I'm taking if I'm eating rice, or the number of chews I'm taking when I'm eating a, a salad. And trust me, it's very interesting because when we're eating rice. the maximum i could chew is just 16 times but when i was eating a salad i could chew it for at least 24 times 32 i haven't reached it yet <laughs> great great thank you so much for sharing it i'm sure everybody is going to start counting too it's an interesting experiment for sure yeah Now, yeah definitely i have i have a question to for nilanjana ma'am swati uh could we just hold on because in the interest of time i don't want to lose out on uh, mommy's question M mommy my question is for you uh what are the challenges with nutrition and cancer patients and uh, which micronutrient should be included and definitely avoided for uh, cancer patients because that is definitely what we see is a result of chronic inflammation one of mm -hmm. the reason so yes please could you share 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Sheetal, for the question. Uh, first of all, cancer is basically what I am deal with is pediatric population, right? So it's very difficult to deal with uh, patients. Like just now, Simi said that is a one quick tip that I can give it to my kid. You know, chew, chew your food and count so that it will be uh, really easy for them. Uh, so basically, the constipation things that is come up uh, uh, for pediatric patient or for oncology uh, patient that is like chemo induced constipation. This is not uh, because they are not eating or that is one of the major factor that is it is chemotherapy induced it's not just only the food right so uh, there are certain drugs like cisplatin cytrobin just a uh, few uh, medications which actually cause uh, severe constipation to the patients uh, which i have observed uh, the other factor which can also lead to constipations like you know low fluid intake if if there is a two year old kid which is already on medication if you are telling as per the body weight key drink 500 m of water that kid is not going to drink at any cost right so that is one of the another factor which i have observed and the you know when it comes to vegetables fruits and the other product that is available uh which can add some fiber in their diet which is just not possible in my cases because uh, most of the time they have this food aversion vomiting is there you know they don't have the taste so in that scenarios it's very difficult to convince you know to add on some other nutrient uh, uh some other uh tips and then asking them to add them in their diet is just uh you know very impossible to convince when there is an active phase of chemotherapy or any active phase of treatment during cancer so when obviously when they get uh, get back to their home after six seven months of active chemotherapy i tend to tell them ki, okay this is the way you can include those many uh, food in your diet but uh not in the active phase phases to be very honest and the another uh the, as nilanjana ma'am said there is you know gut and brain connection so in that case uh obviously when it is it is a pediatric patient who is suffering from cancer and is staying in the hospital for six seven months so it's very difficult to feed the child at that point of time so this constipation is most commonly seen i think my 95 percent of the patient they are developing constipation like anything so there is one another factor that is the neutrophils count so uh, when other neutrophil counts are low, usually during all the leukemia treatments, the neutrophil counts are very low throughout the active phases of the treatment. So in those cases also, sometimes we have to restrict the fruits, like in a raw form. If certain vegetables are also uh, restricted, which uh, like cucumbers and all, if we could say in a form of salad, we can't allow them at that point of time because the child is in uh, a hospital, at a hospital setup, because I worked in a government setup, right? And that in the, those cases, we are trying to give a low bacterial diet, a sterile diet, to the patient so in those scenarios also certain food needs to be restricted and the another part which is very important because i mostly work on food and drug interaction that is 6mp there is a medication which is given in leukemia so in those cases also while taking that medication the child need to avoid dairy products for uh two, two hours before and after consuming that medication so i can't recommend okay go for curd if the child is having constipation go for curd and consume that it's very difficult to you know at that time customize the diet plan for that patient so uh, 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 uh so what i suggest uh you know to improve digestion and you know for uh, healthy gut, uh, bowel movement in those scenarios i recommend fiber supplementation to the uh, patient without delaying much further because uh, when it comes to cancer we can't just wait for you know four or five days okay let's eat this let's include this and then uh, let's uh, uh, you know uh, waiting for their bowel movement no so in that scenario supplementation really works well also not only the child with chemotherapy also with uh, children uh, post uh, surgery it's very important to include the fiber supplements uh, you know to start with bowel movement uh, and uh, also uh, this faulty diet things uh, which uh, ma'am said about we need to think about it we need to customize it and uh, that's how uh, i came up with this thing key fiber supplementation is very very important when it comes to constipation for all the cases oncology cases yeah thank you thank you so much mommy i think you have shared a variety of cancer cases and all of us who are not oncology dietitians will definitely uh, would have made notes and learned immensely from you and for every uh, patient that comes to us with cancer, we will definitely be mindful of checking whether they're constipated or not and on their medications as well. Yes. So at this moment, I would like to uh, thank each and every person uh, of the panel. I would like to thank all the panelists for uh, being here, staying beyond time as well. Thank you so very much. I would like to uh, 
take this moment to thank nilanjana ma'am for a wonderful presentation and a very very insightful presentation we all had a great learning uh, from you ma'am your experience has been very very valuable to us we really appreciate the time that you spent with us and for staying on extra as well thank you so much ritul for inviting me and i think they are very uh, important topics that you discussed in your panel discussion like the uh, one about constipation i work in a gastro hospital and i seem to be looking at a set of patients who are always complaining about constipation and i think uh, indians are obsessed with their bowel movements and they seem to be so if we have uh, solutions which come from diet and certain tools that we can use it's it's very very helpful i think for all of us practicing thank you so much for inviting me thank you thank you very much ma'am thank you thank you uh, i'd also like thank to take you. this opportunity to thank uh, bhavna ma'am and reema ma'am for both helping me organize uh, helping us at good mong and superfoods valley organize uh, this wonderful cne i would like to thank each and every lec member of idea gujarat chapter and net pro fan gujarat chapter for being so supportive so encouraging and bubbling with ideas to make this cne actually very successful thank you so very much thank, thank you so you. much sheetal thank, thank you sheetal thank you sheetal thank you thank you bhavna and reema uh, for having invited me it was a pleasure meeting all the dietitians from gujarat so thank you very much hope to stay in touch with all of you uh, indeed i have to thank you nilanjana i have to thank you for uh, sparing your time and uh, experience and sharing your experiences with us so um, been great thoroughly, connecting so yeah thoroughly yeah. thoroughly enjoyed uh, today's session uh, thank you all bye bye Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.